Good morning. I bid you welcome on this Lord's Day. Glad that you have gathered here, some in person, and for those of you that will be joining online, we are glad to have you worship with us this Lord's Day uh, during Epiphany, the season of light. Christ is the light who has come into the world. By way of announcements, there's several that I've got for you this day on your back cover of your bulletin. If you will notice, there are several things there. One is that I have heard from several of you some feedback in help and willingness to make contacts and uh, to also help with the evangelism team as we'll begin to prayerfully and intentionally try to get back to some sort of normalcy in the coming months. Some of you have already gotten at least one part of your vaccine, if not both. But we uh, just praise God and thank you for your willingness and your feedback as we intentionally will make steps to move forward as safely and as wonderfully as we can. Want to let you be aware in 10 days, so Wednesday week, 7 p.m. We will have an Ash Wednesday worship service here in this space. We will have the, uh, the ashes that will be administered to you at your place, of, in your space, in your pew. So plans have been made to try to do this as safely as we can during this time. But uh, please know you are invited. We hope that you will be here as we have uh, some other specials and things that have been prepared for Ash Wednesday as we begin our Lent on the 17th. I have been working on and have done some updating on our church website. If you get a moment, I have tried to make it as well whether it's on your computer at home or on your handheld device, you should be able to navigate and to find some things. One of the first and easiest things that you will be able to do is to locate a version application of the Bible. And so you will be able to find easily a scripture and you can push on a button in that particular part and it'll even read the text for you. So have done some updating, got newsletter, bulletin, some other communication items on the church website. Hope that you will take time to go by there and to check that out. That's what I have to share with you this morning at this time. May the Lord bless us as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth.
I have a couple of praises with which to share with you this morning. Uh, my baby girl, daughter, Abigail, 16, has had a couple of baby teeth that have wanted to hold on, and she had some surgery. The teeth were removed, and uh, that means that there are a couple of permanent teeth that are, have remained up in the upper jaw, and they have actually had to do surgery and to add buttons and chains with which to pull uh, those teeth down. So that surgery was on Friday, and uh, uh, she is doing absolutely wonderful. Stayed busy enough yesterday that she didn't worry about it too much, but uh, she's, she's doing great, and I offer the Lord praise and thanksgiving to be able to be with her and actually take her to her appointment. And... Uh, we're glad for that. I have a high school friend whose father had recently gone and gotten a CT scan, had had some challenges and difficulties, and with the scan they had noticed a spot on one of his lungs. They began to do and, and said, you know, this is first we've seen of this, and asked him to come back in a month to make sure it didn't get any worse and that they would get a plan of action been in prayer for Kenneth Vickers and uh, uh, he went back got another CT scan and the spot had disappeared uh, what a wonderful wonderful blessing another praise uh, to have an acquaintance in Raleigh over on west side of Raleigh uh, Kim Harward who six months ago uh, had heart transplant surgery at Duke Med Center and this six month uh, time she'd had some medication challenges but uh, since then has done very good last week had biopsies done and they were all showed no rejection and she's gone off of her prednisone for those of you that know of prednisone it is that wonderful medication we have but it also has many side effects and she was able to come off of that at her six-month mark. A fantastic word and a word of praise. So those things that I'm aware of, these praises, uh, wonder in me sort of priming that pump for you if you have a praise this morning. Yes, Sam. Fantastic. We did, miss, uh, we did miss the crowd in that section, and uh, we're glad that you all were able to go to the mountains and to get back safely. Uh, thank you for that report. Yes. Fantastic. We give the Lord thanks for answered prayers with Victoria and that she's getting stronger and ambulating better. Our prayers are with Victoria. Allow me to share these several news things, some of which you may have been aware of and some you might not have gotten word about. Some of you may remember uh, Dr. Sam McMillan, who used to be the pastor here, I think in the 1970s, somewhere thereabouts. Uh, Dr. McMillan and his wife, Fran, lived here in Larnburg, and their son, Mac, I think, played football uh, for Larnburg, for the high school, and actually went in the ministry and served at St. Luke uh, in town as well. But uh, uh, Fran had been in some Ill, Ill health, and she passed this past week, and our prayers are with the McMillan family. I think there are daughters that remain and uh, uh, Paige Max Widow uh, be in prayer for the McMillan family in this season. As well, Stephanie Andrews 
who uh, contacted me yesterday had gone to the emergency department not feeling well. Uh, she uh, is doing better but was told to go home and uh, be on bed rest for a few days. Uh, be in prayers for Stephanie Andrews. Lynn Walter's father recently passed, had had uh, uh, end-stage Parkinson's disease. Uh, prayers are with Lynn Walter's father's family. Marjorie Bridgman, uh, Brigman, uh, Marjorie is doing better, is at home and recovering, doing as well as she can. Continue to lift up in your prayers, uh, Margie Brigman. Are there others? Yes. Okay. Uh, a six-year-old uh, co-worker with Caitlin that is, uh, uh, they suffered loss uh, around Christmas time due to COVID, and uh, she's, she's not doing good. At, uh, our prayers are with them. There's some very wonderful, very large print calendars, jumbo calendars, and you are invited, as long as they last, to enjoy those uh, thanks to uh, James Klein. Thank you for that. May we go to our Lord in prayer. Gracious Lord, we gather together in this place, at this time, mindful of the many needs, the many answered prayers, the many petitions that we place before you this day. We intercede on their behalves that you would bless, give strength to, comfort, that in their time of grieving and mourning, in their time of recovery and challenge, you desire to manifest yourself to each. We offer and pray that your peace might abide with them all. We praise you this day that in this season of Epiphany, as we look toward Ash Wednesday and Lent, a time of preparation, that we might as well realize all that you have in store for us. Thank you, Lord, for calling us all by name and for gathering us together as your body. Bless us and our efforts, our times, our gifts. For we make each in the precious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue now in our worship with the giving of God's tithes and of our offerings.
you will remain standing as I will read our gospel lesson this morning from the first chapter of the gospel according to St. Mark. I'll begin with the 29th verse. In this scripture, at the top of this, the heading is Jesus heals many. Hear now this gospel. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they immediately told Jesus about her. And so he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not allow the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. This is the word of God for us, the children of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. In the gospel, and in this early section of Mark's gospel, the first one written, he begins Jesus' ministry. And there's a lot you can tell in which Jesus is in, in, in desiring and intending to do. And as he is around others, he sees their need. He has compassion for them. He feels for them. And he cures their many illnesses. He heals them. The scripture is very clear, especially in Mark's gospel, because even the demons know who Jesus is. We know who you are. You're the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus sternly orders them, as it says in Mark's gospel, the first chapter, not to say anything. Don't say it yet. But it seems as though the more it is put that way, the more they realize what Jesus is doing is miraculous. He's healing people of many illnesses. At the home, there, uh, the mother-in-law, sick and in bed, Jesus heals her. And the scripture says she immediately got up out of bed and went in the kitchen and began to feed them. In the scriptures, this relationship in the gospel, forgiveness and healing seem to really work hand in hand. Forgiveness of sins leads to be made well, whole, how God created and intended in 
the garden from the beginning. And that kind of relationship is that which Jesus seeks to restore. The brokenness of sin. The brokenness in the body that he sees. And when he sees it, he has compassion for them and heals them. So forgiveness and healing run very closely together in the scriptures. And it's with that idea and thought this morning that I want to really sort of hold on to the uh, forgiveness part of today's passage. Forgiveness. And trying to understand and equate what it means and what it looks like and how it feels when we receive God's forgiveness. Forgiveness as though it never even happened. You know, we live in a world where there's language for almost every single thing we do. I remember early on as I began to learn the computer and the differing things. You know, some computers had mouse uh, if you had an Apple computer. And those of us who really just began with the word processor, you began to have to hit buttons on that keyboard to get what they called the cursor to a certain place. I wonder whoever came up with that language and called it a cursor. I don't know, but kind of ironic, is it not? We have language with almost everything we do. The United Methodist Church is not immune to having our own kind of language as well. The United Methodist Church... Uh, who wants to say all that mouthful all the time? Sometimes we just abbreviate it and say UMC. We live in a world where we like to try to get right down to the heart of it. For instance, if you're in the military and you hear someone says, the CO said, uh, you chime in pretty quickly to know that means commanding officer. That means a little higher rank than you. And when E.F. Hutton talks, you listen, right? We live in that kind of world. And so uh, there's this world that exists as well in the game of golf. For many of us, it's a game. Some people make their living by playing that game of golf. But it has very life-applicable lessons that can be used and utilized when we think about the game of golf. I remember growing up, every once in a while, and when I lived in Raleigh and would on a Friday afternoon want to go play some golf, I'd just show up at Cheviot Hills in North Raleigh. And there, if I had my clubs, could then sign up and, and go out. They would pair us together with two or three others so you wouldn't be by yourself. And sure enough, as we would set out across the golf course and start down the holes, there would be conversations that would ensue. We teed off on about the fourth hole. It seems like that's always the one in which this question would come. I knew it was coming. And sure enough, we teed off on the fourth hole and started down to get to the ball. And the question came from the one in, that was riding with me. So what do you do? And I said, I'm a Methodist minister. And you can see every single time the blood drops from their face and they think to themselves, oh my goodness, have I cursed or have I thrown a club yet? Which leads me to a lesson that my father used to say as he taught me the game of golf. He said, son, there are certain lessons in this game that you are to observe because as a golfer, it is a gentleman's game, meaning not just for men, but there are rules that you abide by and that you go by. The one furthest from the hole is the one who plays next at the tee at each box. It's the one who scored the lowest on the previous hole. So there's a whole list of rules about the game of golf that are part of the etiquette 
that one is to observe. And it's with that and explaining that to you that there's one word that I want to focus on as I think about and have told you the focus is on forgiveness. There is a term, and every once in a while when we would play with some of our guys, we'd say, well, you, everybody gets a mulligan on the front nine and one on the back nine for you to take at any particular time of your choosing. But it's just one per each nine holes, which means we know you're going to mess up, especially most of the time it's off of the tee when you try to hit that ball the farthest in the whole time and you hit it and swing it, and sometimes if you don't hit it very well, it can do some ugly stuff. You intend for it to go this way, and it ends up going off that way. But once every nine holes, you get to say, I'm going to play my mulligan. And what does that word mean? Well, in golf, if you hit the ball out of bounds, or if you do some other things, there are, you have to count your strokes. A mulligan means, if you call it, you'll get to actually go pick up that ball, bring it back to the tee, and act as though that shot never even happened. A mulligan. Those things are the most wonderful thing that you have in the game of golf among friends, that is. On the tour, there is no such thing. You play where you lie, and if you can't play it, you will actually pick up and have a penalty for doing so. Mulligan. Psychiatrist Scott Peck writes about the game of golf. He says, Golf can teach us a great deal about life and about each other. And he goes on to explain a little bit the philosophy of what we can do and what can be done in this sport to be able to uh, have what he calls life condensed. It's opportunity for us to either play it and play it like it's supposed to, or are we going to cut corners and not observe the rules? I remember in playing golf some of the times in which I enjoyed and some of the times in which were very frustrating. One of the times that I remember as I think about the game of golf, probably one of the, uh, the most desired among the tour is the Masters in Augusta, Georgia. And I remember because there was this one particular year when this Spaniard was leading the Masters on the last day on Sunday afternoon. The world is watching thousands upon thousands. And Seve Ballesteros, he was one of those that was a great golfer, but you know how it is. You've got to play the game and you've got to get through it because even good golfers sometimes make huge mistakes. And sure enough, the thing and one of the reasons that I enjoyed pulling against Seve Ballesteros, the Spaniard, was that he would talk total junk about the American tour. But he didn't mind playing it and taking their money, however. And on this occasion at the Masters, the last day, he'd made the turn at Amen Corner, and he's got just four or five holes left to play. And he hit the golf ball on a par five, second shot, trying to make it to the green, and it plops in the water. His master's tournament was done. It's like that sometimes in life. We realize that while it might be a good day and things are going our way, that it all depends on the very next shot. What are we going to do? How are we going to conduct ourselves? And what are we going to do in life when we knock the ball in the water? There is our opportunity to know who we are. And so with that, I've got eight lessons very quickly and briefly that I will share with you that transpire 
transcribe very well from the game of golf into the game of life as well. Number one, while I do not enjoy being humiliated, the game of golf will have its time that you will be so. Get used to it. You're going to stumble and fall. Number two, be attentive to the hazards. As we chart our lives in church, in life, we know that there are certain hazards and things that we will uh, have come along our way. Be mindful of them. You find those hazards by reading your scripture and by praying. Number three, strive to do your best. I, you know, I live in a family where there were the three girls and myself, but I tell you, we all were very competitive with each other. And we always wanted to outdo the other, always wanting to do our best. Number four, learn from your mistakes. You know, on the golf course, there are certain hazards and things that you will get into, and you have certain patterns and things that you want to try to do. The thing for us to realize is that we should learn from our mistakes. Four, play to win. Play to win. It, it also will let us know that we're not going to win all the time. But we should play with all that we've got and enjoy life to the fullest. Number six, take an unplayable lie. Now, here's a confession for me. I don't play on the tour. I don't uh, uh, do all these things. Uh, when I play golf, I play golf in such a way that uh, I'm not going to ruin a golf club because I can see it laying on a root. I'll take and move it uh, golf club length to, uh, uh, to move it. I call, they call it winter rules. W-I-N-T-E-R. Uh, take an unplayable lie. Number seven, play one hole at the time. Have you ever known and noticed people who it seems wherever they are in life, they're always looking someplace else, not giving themselves full attention in the here and now. Play one hole at the time. Deal with whatever issue that we have currently and deal with it the best we know how. And then the final, number eight, and most important lesson, both in life and in golf. Use your mulligan. Mulligan means in life that when we stumble and fall, when we make mistakes, to be willing to forgive ourselves. It's one of those things for me, I've always tend to be the hardest on myself. And when I don't achieve, I seem to take it out on myself. Be willing to take your mulligan. Because in this life, we know someone who cares and has compassion for us. And we know through this scripture today that he desires to minister to us at our need. And we're all in need of forgiveness. May we pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for this day and for your calling of us to be and to do our best and to know at the, the end of the day when we don't quite match up, we can be forgiven. Help us, dear Lord, we pray. 
and give us strength for this journey in life and in faith. In Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, Amen. With that thought in mind, we think about this sacrament of Holy Communion and what Christ has done for us. As you may already uh, have at your pews, you will have your communion cup. If you would, you can go ahead and get it and put it in your hand. It is not the easiest thing. Well, I just said that, and that's the quickest I've ever been able to get that cellophane. Uh, But have your communion cup in your hand as I go through this ritual, maybe every once in a while looking at it, thinking about the words that are being said about this bread and this cup. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty. Before the mountains were brought forth, you formed us. You're everlasting and everlasting. You alone are God. You created light light out of darkness and brought forth life upon this earth. You formed us in your image. You breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You spoke to us through your prophets. We read your scriptures and your word and we know of your love for us. And so with your people on earth and all of the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, in whom You revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. You sent a star to guide us on our way and journey in life and in faith. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave life to your church, and you delivered us and made covenant to be our sovereign God. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks as he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice as we proclaim the mystery of life. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. By your Spirit, make us one with each other, one in ministry and mission to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, both now and forever. Amen. And if you will, go ahead and reveal, pull back the cellophane and and hold up your wafer. You may commune.
than to reveal and pull back the foil a little ways for the cup. You may commune. May we be in a spirit of prayer. we stand for the benediction. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide with you all both now and forevermore. Amen.